One of the paradox of our human condition is that it is often those things that are most important to us in our lives we have a tendency to take for granted. Uh, whether it's uh, the magic and vitality of our youth, which we certainly don't fully appreciate until it's gone forever, our physical health and emotional resilience, our Australian citizenship, whether conferred by birth or by choice, affording, as it does, political, economic and religious freedoms. To live in this country where faith coexists with reason, free academic inquiry, an independent judiciary and a free press. It's very tempting, uh, again, human beings that we are, to settle for the broad brushstrokes, the popular mythology and imagery of our history, in neglectful ignorance of the vision, the sacrifices and the hard-won policy debates that shape the country that we now have. Those men and women who gave us what we have and made us who we are. When I had applied for and then had been advised uh, following an interview that I was going to be the director of the Australian War Memorial, I confided in one of my friends before the announcement was made and he said to me, you're going to what? You're going to run the Australian War Memorial? He said to me, you're wasting your life. You've got far more important things to do for Australia, he said, than rearrange its history. And in response to him, I said in part, well, it actually has a lot more to do with the future than it does the past. As we face unseen, emerging and increasingly threatening horizons, what is most important to us is to be clear about who we are, in what it is we believe, truths by which we live, the values that define us, which we believe are worth fighting to, to defend. Now, David may disagree, but to me, the most important year in this country's history, after 1788, is 1942. And it was also the year in which T.S. Eliot wrote, a people without history is not redeemed from time, for history is a pattern of endless moments. When little else in the world makes sense, history is the defining discipline. <laughs> It carries extraordinarily important lessons for us and the future that we seek to shape. It can demolish prejudice. It is a reminder, as David has documented so magnificently in this towering work, that there are hard decisions that have to be made and the importance of making them and not shying away from them. And it can also inspire and point us to new horizons. The Greeks coined, coined the word character. They called it the impression left in wax by a stone seal ring, the stamp of personality. And character, whether of individuals or of nations, is informed by worthwhile intrinsic values or virtues. Those values that define us as Australians have come to us through our triumphs as a people and our failures. The men and women whom we choose to honour and revere and also villains. And the way as a people we have been shaped and defined by adversities and how we will be shaped by those that are coming. Our values are not the subject of a social media posting. They're not a statement of what we're doing today or what we think we're going to be doing over the next week or even what we think we're going to be about for the next one or two decades. They are enduring and they are deeply rooted in the history and, as I say, the men and women who made us and gave us what we have. When the late Senator John McCain, whom I regard as a true and great champion of the Republican Party in the United States, when he came to the Australian War Memorial uh, for a one hour visit, which went for two and a half hours in May 2017, I said to him, amongst other things, of the memorial, this is where we reveal our character. It's hard to understand us until you come here. And indeed, while we're allies of the United States, we're not just good friends. 
I said, here we reveal our values. And we had a discussion of that and I said to him, and our interests are our values. And he said our values are our interests, something which he subsequently uh, raised with President Trump. We cannot, in facing our future, in the most consequential geopolitical realignment in our lifetimes, to abandon what Arthur Schlesinger described as historic purpose. We have to be informed by a sense of not only who we are, but from where we have come. I've said to young people over the years, never agree to launch a book unless you've read it. So I'm sure no one in this room, Nick in particular, has ever launched a book without actually reading it. So when it arrived, a liberal state, 1926 to 1966, David Kemp, I thought, okay, here we go. And uh, I should also say, by the way, paying deference to my employer, uh, that uh, I am the president and chair, executive chairman of Boeing for Australia, New Zealand and the Pacific. So that's my day job. So I thought I better find a bit of time to read the book. It is a towering masterpiece. David, I wish that it had been written 30 years ago and that I had read it before I had the privilege to serve the Liberal Party and the people of Bradfield in the Australian Parliament. Uh, it, it is informative, it's easy to read, it brings understanding and enlightenment to who we are and where we are today, and there is much in this, in particular, that should be read by our contemporary Liberal Party leaders. I, I won't uh, obviously go through all of it, but there are a couple of things in particular I'd like to share with you in term, in, by way of launching the book. David sets the framework for, the, for it all in the introduction. And I quote, This is the story of how Australians fought a bitter political battle over how they were to be governed and how they came to decide despite the urgent demands of special interests for privilege and notwithstanding the passion of those who promised salvation through the wisdom of government, that they believed the good society was one in which they could control their own lives and express their individuality. Government's role, they still believed, was to empower them to achieve their dreams. And then, The liberal democratic state was one in which power was checked, balanced and devolved in the interests of preventing its arbitrary exercise against citizens, eroding their liberty to control their own lives. The battle of ideas between utopian socialism and liberalism was therefore a battle over the nature of the Australian state, hence the title of the book. Liberals continued to grapple with issues arising from the ideas of the nation's foundation and the meaning of those ideas for the state interventions that had already occurred, the state enforcement of morality, industry protection, compulsory arbitration of workplace disputes, government service monopolies, organised marketing and industry licensing and Aboriginal protection. And then David speaks with some eloquence and power about what I think has driven hit you all of your life, David, and that is ideas. Ideas, although intangible and invisible, are in fact the principal directors of political life because without ideas, there is no motivation, people cannot act, movements cannot be formed, institutions cannot be constructed, policies cannot be devised, and human betterment will not occur. As the English liberal economist John Maynard Keynes once said, the world is indeed moved by little else. Then, speaking of uh, liberals, he says, Australian liberals continue to grapple with issues arising from the nation's foundation and the meaning of those ideas for the state interventions that had already occurred the state enforcement of morality, industry protection, as I said, and compulsory arbitration. And then, as I say, I'll skip over some of the things that I was going to highlight to you. And then of the forgotten people, of course, which is the foundation series of addresses, again, in 1942, which, which is our true north. 
The forgotten people talks show Menzies at his distinguished intellectually, dealing simply and clearly with weighty matters for the successful conduct of the war and for post-war policies. His vigorous opposition to the rhetoric of class hatred, to the use of racial hatred as an instrument of war, the proper purpose of wartime censorship, the financing of the war, the principles for rationalising industry to provision of the war effort, the role of women during and after the war, education during the war and the need for a massive expansion when the war had ended, and the need to give appropriate attention to planning for the post-war world. He reiterated his strongly held view that the Labor Party's decision not to suspend party politics for the duration of the war was a grave misfortune for Australia and reminded listeners that it was a decision he had done, that he had done his very best to avoid, even to the extent of being prepared to serve under a Prime Minister drawn from the Labor Party. Then of values. The underlying disease of selfishness and irresponsibility. He's, the, David writes, he argued, that's Menzies, that after the war Australia should establish a contributed insurance scheme to discourage the entitlement mentality, emphasising the importance of wealth creation by private enterprise for a successful system of social security. He warned against the false expectation that the end of the war would eventually bring with it a better inevitable life. In the absence of sound human values, his main emphasis was on the culture and values that underlay a liberal and decent society and needed to be re rebuilt. And Menzies said, men will not necessarily be better because they are better off. And that is one of the key challenges that of course, we all want economic growth. We need it. But the fundamental question is, toward what are we striving to grow? It is to build a better society, not only of prosperity and economic security and individual freedoms, but also the inherent value and dignity of human life and social cohesion, which is something which Menzies himself identified. He said, Menzies, this is, the disease of selfishness and irresponsibility. If the new material order or an improved material order is to serve the biggest needs of mankind, it must be accompanied by a moral revolution, which will make every citizen feel that the well-being of his country is his own responsibility, that he is his brother's keeper and that his stature as a citizen will depend far more upon what he gives than what he gets a long time before John Kennedy's inauguration speech. And then of the political opponents of the Liberal Party, which speaks not only to David's immense intellect, but also his character as a man. So of John Curtin, I'll just read a little bit. He says, from such a perspective, Curtin embodied within his tormented self the irreconcilable forces at war within his party. He was the very symbol of its divided soul. Identification with a version of the utopian mission of Australian unionism on the one hand and with his country, Australia, as a patriot on the other, warned, warred on in his mind. His final decision that Australia was preeminent put him at odds with bitter foes in his own party for whom national unity was a goal of subordinate value and whose primary identifications with the labour movement, not with the nation. And then he says, John Curtin's selfish, <coughs> selflessness and decency in his treatment of others attracted wide praise and his desire to put Australia's interests first was recognised. And then of Ben Shifley, David writes, a decent and patriotic man, a Catholic, was now in the front line in the battle for Labour's soul. He didn't forget those who had attacked him in the New South Wales party, nor did Lang, Jack Lang, biding his time for revenge, forgive Chifley. Nor could the new Prime Minister pardon those who had imposed such burdens on the vulnerable John Curtin from win within Labor's ranks. And then he says, of all Labor's federal parliamentary leaders, as his church mobilised to join the battle against athe uh, uh, atheistic communism, 
Chifley would be the one who would at last summon the courage to take the fight to the revolutionary extremists and the Lang tradition that had done so much damage to the party and to the country. The 1946, it's okay, I won't, won't go on too much longer, David. Um, I'm not gonna read the whole book. Um, <laughs> but I wish I, I have read the whole book. And uh, yeah, anyway, so the 1946 election campaign and Menzies campaigning and his election campaign address is something if you have not read it, that I strongly recommend to you. So David writes, and this is a contemporary issue, as I said, history informs the choices, decisions we have to make now. His appeal to women was not simply to women in traditional social roles, but also for a transformation in the role of women in Australian life. Menzies said this in 46, tonight I speak to the women of Australia with profound respect and gratitude. They have established an unanswerable claim to economic, legal, industrial and political equality. I hope that the time will speedily come when we can say truthfully that there is no sex discrimination in public or private office, in political or industrial opportunity. We are all men and women, citizens with a common interest and a common task. And then another aspect which comes through in David's very well-researched and detailed writing is that it was Menzies in the early 1960s who worked very carefully to erode support within the Liberal Party for the White Australia policy, to bring Aboriginal Australians into mainstream Australian life in every sense of the word, and create those conditions which would come in the middle of that decade for the referendum, which of course he initiated for 1967, and of course the abolition of the White Australia policy. But I'd just like to, to finish, and I know you're looking for that bit, um, again to speak to our contemporary leaders. In April 1965, Menzies addressed the Federal Council of the Liberal Party at the Hotel Canberra, where he'd stayed during the meetings of the Unity Conference, of course, in 1944, uh, when they were establishing the party. And he said this, we are 21 today and we have the key to the door. That's something we ought to remember politically. We have indeed been either fortunate or wise, or a mixture of both, because one of the outstanding things about this party, 21 years old, is that it has secured the support of Australia. I am quite convinced of the young and ardent who are ambitious and self-reliant, Australia would not have made the enormous advances that it has made. It has been a community of people of independent minds. The fact that Australia has grown as it has demonstrates that we are a people of independent mind who aim to be contributors as well as beneficiaries. He said, as David writes, that the Liberal Party won this support because it had not been conservative but innovative. And Menzies said, over the whole of this period of 15, 16 years since 1949, we have won because we have been the party of innovations, not the party of the past, not the Conservative Party dying on the last barricade, but the party of innovations. These were evidences of a lively mind and a forward-looking heart. This is the whole thing that we must continue to remember and act upon in the years ahead. And finally, in his defence of liberalism during the 40s, Menzies had reached out for the impossible. The political correctness of the day was that capitalism was finished, that socialism was taking over, the British were going down that road, and Menzies, of course, resisted all of that in convinced in the liberty and the freedoms and the creativity of the ind individual. And therein, as David so powerfully reminds us in the book, it is not about having power for its own sake. It's about how power can be used to shape the future of the country that we need for the next generation. As John Howard said to us so many times, David, that once the mob, as Howard would say, think that you've run out of ideas, that is when they will look to the other side. We, as Liberals, 
must be led by men and women who are prepared to fight for the things in which we believe that are essential for the future of the country and not simply to regard keeping and sustaining power as an end in itself. Now, the person you're really here for, David, uh, of course, David is a proud alumnus of Scotch College, of Melbourne University. He has a PhD in political science from Yale. Uh, as you well know, he was an advisor to Malcolm Fraser when he was Prime Minister. I wish he'd been advising him once he stopped being Prime Minister, David. But uh, uh, um, he's also, uh, uh, also, of course, written extensively about Robert Menzies, about Malcolm Fraser, uh, about liberalism, uh, our own political history, and uh, an immense and giant contributor to our intellectual uh, life. Uh, David, uh, after 11 years of Professor of uh, Political Science and Politics at Monash University, uh, was elected to be the member for Goldstein in 1990. He was a shadow minister. When we won in 96, uh, he was Minister for Schools and Vocational Education. He also supported the Prime Minister in reforming the public service and the Finance Minister in privatisation. He went into Cabinet as Minister for Employment, Education, Training and Youth Affairs, and then that was passed to me. And then he uh, was our Minister for Environment and Heritage. He was President of our party in uh, Victoria from 2007 till 2011, and of course, uh, as the uh, Vice-Chancellor's Fellow for Melbourne University, has uh, put his considerable intellect uh, to, to this, the fourth in the series. And in thinking of introducing David, I, I thought if someone asked me, as I have now been asked about David, I regard David as decent, honest, extraordinarily intelligent, clear-minded, uh, decisive, a man who is motivated by public duty to dedicate his life, to, apart from being a, a husband and a father, to do the very best that he can to leave a better future for the next generation and to never allow Liberals to forget who we are. So thank you. Brendan, thank you for that um, magnificent address and I could have sat there all night listening to you. <laughs> it, uh, <clears throat> you've obviously put a lot of time into reading the book and I'm thrilled beyond measure that you've reached the judgment that you have about it. Um, I've always valued our association. Um, you're a very significant figure in this country, um, both as a, in the medical profession but particularly as a minister. Um, as my successor in a portfolio and in that wonderful conduct of the role of head of the Australian War Memorial in which you've, I think, lifted the spirits of the nation and its understanding of how so many people have given their lives to protect what we in this life of ours and I've tried in this book uh, to say are the great liberal values and democratic values of Australia. Um, it's been costly and you've told the nation what that cost is and the commitment that it takes. So <clears throat> your words have a special meaning, I think, not only to me but to everyone here and I'm very, very grateful that you saw fit to accept Nick's invitation to come here tonight and, and launch the book. I, I consider it a great honour that you've done that. So thank you very much. <laughs> there are many people that I want to thank. Um, some of them are not here tonight, um, so I'll be brief about them, but I must thank my editors at the... Melbourne University Publishing and the Margunya Press. Um, I thank my, my friends who had the fortitude to read drafts of the book and contribute to my thinking about the book. Uh, Dennis White in Melbourne. Um, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm so grateful to, uh, to them. Uh, 
I want to um, acknowledge uh, particularly my family um, and Anne-Marie, who has allowed me really uh, to write this book and encourage me to do so uh, and encourage me to keep at it until it's finished. And she's here tonight and uh, without that wonderful tolerance and encouragement and enthusiasm for the project, I doubt if it would have reached even this stage. So uh, I thank Anne-Marie from the bottom of my heart. Of course... <clears throat> Of course, right um, uh, in front of us tonight and, and the person to whom I, I give enormous thanks is Nick Cater uh, and to the Menzies Research Centre um, and Paul, um, the Menzies Research Centre is really the sine qua non without which we wouldn't have this publication before us um, and it's the insight of Nick uh, who's a wonderful contributor to our debate. I don't know how he does it, actually. It's uh, an amazing, his, his production of these uh, stimulating and uh, um, incredibly well-read columns several times a week in, in The Australian and elsewhere. And Rebecca, um, for your support and, and your encouragement uh, as well through The Spectator and, and, and other expressions, I thank you both very much and Nick, you know, you've done uh, me a tremendous service and I hope that people who read the book will feel that uh, they owe you a lot. Um, I, I want to acknowledge uh, the Cormac Foundation for its support, uh, financial support for these latest volumes. Uh, they are a very strongly motivated group of people to support what I call in this book the Liberal Project. I want to say that this book, for those who are thinking of buying it and haven't yet committed themselves to it, uh, that this book is um, about a man that I consider has not nearly received his due in Australian history. In fact, uh, I, I have wondered whether there is a difficulty that Fra Australia has in recognising the level of greatness that Robert Menzies typifies. For many in the world, he was the world's greatest liberal statesman. Even the leaders of other countries saw that, that Robert Menzies stood alone. And he stands alone, certainly, in Australian political life for his belief in the power of ideas and in his skill uh, and in articulating those ideas and relating them to the life of the Australian people. And... In this book, I see Robert Menzies as the person who rescued in Australia a damaged Liberal project. That Robert Menzies came to office believing that Australia was not doing the right thing by its democracy or its history. That he said in the previous decade, I can't remember legislation which encourages people's enterprise and their freedom and their innovation. Uh, and he was talking not about individuals really so much as industry, that everybody wants to be dependent on the state, that this country will never be great unless people take personal responsibility, as Brendan was kind enough to quote, for their contribution to Australia, and they will only do that if they have the freedom to do so. And the path of socialism is a dead end. People say they want socialism for security, but without progress and innovation and change, there is no security, and without freedom, we will never get the security we want. And that's an incredibly powerful and strong message, which Menzies stood up, again, as, as Brendan was kind enough to, to mention, uh, at a time when the political correctness was absolutely against him. That for someone to get up and say capitalism wasn't finished, that 
We didn't need all this government regulation of the, that had been imposed on us during the war. We needed to be free once again to express what we can do as individuals. People thought there was something mad about that. And he would give an election speech in which the first two or three pages were actually pages of liberal principles. And he would say at the end of that, I make no apology for saying this because without these ideas, we will never rebuild this nation and put its government on a sound basis. And Menzies really took a country which had been damaged by the notion that it was better to be non-competitive, was better to shut our borders, was better to keep our heads down in the world. It, it was better to regulate the workplace in every detail. It was better to protect every industry efficient or not. It was better to spread protection around rather than have a competitive country. And those were incredibly difficult ideas to challenge. And Menzies was the most brilliant politician. He understood which ideas he could challenge and move and which ones he'd quietly erode the foundations of so that they could be challenged. And they were challenged, either by him or by those who came immediately after him, because he had laid the basis. So we owe an enormous amount to a man dedicated to ideas. And that's what this book is really about. And thank you, Brendan, for making the points that Menzies was not so partisan in this that he couldn't see the tremendous values of people on the other side of politics. And indeed, he had warm friendships across the aisle. He didn't agree with them and he didn't hesitate to say that he didn't agree but he recognised the human qualities. And in the end, I think, if you ask what is the Liberal Project's main purpose, it is human dignity through freedom. That's what Arthur Phillip brought with him into Sydney Harbour. It's what the Liberal governors the stories I tell in the, the first volume thought about. It's about those who thought that you could do this and have democracy as well, which is what the second volume is about. And as I contemplate finishing this series now, not in volume four, but there's one more to come, I'm sorry to say, uh, it will be how liberalism can only be established properly on a sound foundation when it is accepted by the people. When they see that that is the way forward and the way so they can realise their dreams and realise a country that can be a model to the world. And this volume tonight, being launched tonight, lays the foundation for that. And I think those, most of those who are here, of course, perhaps all who are here tonight, are in their own minds confirmed liberals, very sympathetic to liberalism. They want it to succeed. And I'd just like to say a final comment about where I think those who want to be active Liberals need to focus their attention. And that is, in the Liberal Party, there are no special interests that say, this is what our party is about. It's going to give us privileges and it's going to give us benefits. The Liberal Party is the party of individual people. And individual people want purpose and direction and without an understanding of the ideas and the leadership on behalf of those ideas, that will never happen. And that's what volume four really shows you, that somebody with those ideas can bring hundreds of thousands of people together in an active life, an active political life, and contribute to building a nation through those ideas. That's very important for Liberals <coughs> to know that these are not just things we can 
put in a box and say this is what the party believes or a brief we believe statement or anything of that kind. They've got, you've got to understand the nature of them and how they affect reality. And what I've tried to do in these four volumes so far is to spell out those ideas and link them to action. And by linking them to action, show that there is a liberal project in this country which is cross generations and people fight for as you fight for them. So many in this room and I see Andrew Robb, my successor in Goldstein, here tonight. Thank you for coming, Andrew. Um, that is the inspiration, really, that I'm hoping people will get from this book and the power to make the arguments and the case that will show why freedom is the way to human dignity and that you can't achieve human dignity without it. So thank you very much.